News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with Michael Portillo, a cover to cover caper through culture, arts, politics and world affairs. It's been a seismic start to the year for Britain on both the domestic and foreign fronts. The scandal of injustice against hundreds of the country's sub postmasters gathers pace following the heartrending drama on ITV, dragging yet more of this country's institutions into the mire of disrepute. Will any heads roll? Does the British establishment ever take responsibility for anything? Rishi Sunak has authorised British involvement in airstrikes against the Houthi rebels in Yemen to degrade their ability to attack international shipping. Are we leading the world into a minefield? My political panel will join me in the studio very shortly. Our Prime Minister also flew to Ukraine this week to pledge two and a half billion pounds of aid to the country and security guarantees to help it to counter the Russian invasion. Since the beginning of the war, the Ukrainian journalist Svetlana Moronets has updated British observers weekly through her reporting in The Spectator magazine. She'll be here to tell me what to expect in 2024. And last week brought the death of a legend of the SAS. He was an early recruit to the legendary regiment that inflicted enormous losses on General Rommel's German troops in North Africa, while he badly fired a shot. Mike Sadler guided SAS soldiers through the Libyan desert using only the sun and stars, relying on navigational techniques that dated back to the seafaring exploits of Drake and Raleigh. Historian of the SAS, Gavin Mortimer, will join me to discuss his life. Finally, in the first hour, Stefan Kiriazis will give me his first theatre reviews of this new year. And it promises to be a phantasmagorical critique. All of that to come, but first your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hello there, very good morning to you. It is just after 11 o'clock, I'm Aaron Armstrong. At least four migrants have died trying to cross the English Channel overnight. A small boat carrying dozens of people got into difficulties just off a French beach north of the port of Boulogne. A huge rescue effort then took place with French maritime vessels, a helicopter and emergency services combing the beach area at Wimereau. A further two migrant boats arrived in UK waters early this morning at least 100 people have been taken to Dover. The Foreign Secretary has warned the Houthis of further strikes in Yemen if attacks in the Red Sea continue. Lord Cameron says the UK has sent an unambiguous message but will continue to back words with action. Writing in The Telegraph, he says disruption in the Red Sea threatens vital supply chains which could force prices up in Britain. Defence Procurement Minister James Cartledge says the UK-US joint strikes were necessary. The Houthis were um, attacking international shipping from many countries. They've been doing so since November, wholly uh, unjustified, in indiscriminate attacks which put lives at risk, let alone the economic consequences. And of course, ultimately, they attacked a British naval vessel, HMS Diamond, which put us in the position where the Prime Minister concluded, uh, concluded that he had no choice but to act in the manner that he did. A rally marking 100 days since the 7th of October massacre in Israel will be staged in central London later. In Tel Aviv, thousands of people are staging a 24-hour demonstration, uh, many wearing military-style dog tags, which have become a symbol of solidarity with the hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza. And more than 1,200 people were killed during the raid by the terror group in southern Israel. The Hamas-run health ministry says almost 24,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israel in Gaza. A record 420,000 patients had to wait more than 12 hours in A&E last year. The latest NHS England figures show 1 in 15 patients faced so-called trolley waits, which have been linked to excess deaths and increased harm to patients. The number also reflects a 20% increase on 2022. The Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davies, accusing the Prime Minister of driving the health service into the ground. An Arctic blast is hitting the UK, prompting weather warnings. Northern Scotland could see up to 10 centimetres of snow today, and it'll be a similar scene in Northern Ireland tomorrow. 
Freezing temperatures are forecast to move further south over the course of the week, affecting parts of northern England. Roads and railways are likely to be disrupted. New analysis shows the majority of injuries caused by e-scooter crashes go unreported. A government study found fewer than 10% of casualties treated at hospital have been reported to the police. Now, private e-scooters cannot be legally ridden on roads or pavements, but they have become a common sight, particularly in the cities. 11 riders and one pedestrian died in e-scooter crashes in Britain in 2022, and almost 1,500 people were injured. Sat-navs are to be updated with the latest driving data under new government plans. Until now, traffic regulation orders like temporary speed limits or road closures were not automatically updated on digital systems, but the new rules mean valuable data, like location of parking spaces, will also be available on sat-navs. A volcano is erupting again in southwest Iceland. These live pictures have been showing, showing lava spewing into the air, uh, and out of the fissure, the lava is flowing towards the town of Grindavik, which has been evacuated for a second time. The residents were forced to leave their homes last month as well. It is the fifth eruption on the peninsula since 2021. We are live across the UK on TV, on digital radio, and if you want us on your smart speaker, say play GB News. Now it's back to Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron Armstrong. For months, Houthi rebels have defied the West, using missiles, drones and boarding parties to terrorise freighters entering the Red Sea, sailing towards the Suez Canal. This week, the anticipated response arrived as a coalition of countries led by the United States and Britain mounted retaliatory airstrikes. Meanwhile, I am sure that in my memory, Britain has never functioned worse than today. The NHS is in collapse, and even to get a doctor's appointment online is unachievable for many. The railways function only periodically. The rottenness of the British state has been laid bare by the post office scandal. Although ministers and MPs have known of the scandal for years, it's taken a television drama for the government to admit that it can do something to bring about restitution. How can we have faith in British justice that convicted so many innocent people? Beyond that, our police forces have lost public confidence, immigration is not under control, the government's unable to build new houses, schools or railways, civil servants don't go to the office and are unaccountable. MPs are involved in scandals. Meanwhile, the only reforms that are undertaken seem to move us closer to the sinister absurdities of wokery. These are conditions that ought perhaps to produce a revolution. Has the public just decided that nothing will ever get better? So I ask my panel, what is the mood and morale of the British people as they prepare to vote this year? I have with me Ivor Kaplan, former Defence Minister, Aubrey Allegretti, the senior political correspondent at The Times, and political consultant Alex Dean. Welcome to you all to GB News. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, Alex, how do you react to my rant? <laughs> well, I've learned not to be too sceptical of the Portillo soothsaying. Um, you may not remember, but we were at a grand funeral, if that's the right term to use, just before coronavirus um, kicked in. And you looked out at the sea of faces and said, we shall not meet like this again for a long time. And I thought, come on, Portillo, that's a bit glum. And then we went straight into two years of lockdown. So I'm not, I'm not going to be too sceptical of your negativity. But it, I, I can see some things that are more positive that are happening that for which Britain, not necessarily the government, but Britain doesn't get credit. Mm -hmm. Our economy has performed much better than people were expecting, the much better than the OMB thought, much better than international observers thought, and better than the IMF thought. So that, that's part one. One thing the government probably does deserve credit on, you know, the migration um, flows about 18 months ago were very heavily consisting of people coming from Albania, and that has stopped almost completely. You know, if you can do it with one country, then you can do it with others. But your broader... Mm -hmm. you, yeah, your broader, at least in principle, mm -hmm. your broader thrust, though, about morale and, and attitude, I think, is right. But I wonder how much that's cause and effect. I wonder how much people feel miserable because we tell them they should. Mm. So, um, I mean, you raised some very interesting points there. But what actually do you think is the state of the British electorate's morale? Oh, it's low. Uh, and I don't think we've ever seen a time when there's been less faith in 
politics and politicians than today. I think, generally speaking, British people like to think people go into politics for the right reasons. They, they believe, even if the rest of them aren't great, their own MP is a good egg and listens to them and so forth. I think that broad sort of trust in the system is at a lower ebb than any time in my lifetime. I have a captain. I didn't mention in introducing you that you were a part of the Labour government, yep. in case people didn't know which minister <laughs> you were in. Um, what, what's your reaction to the Portillo rant? Uh, it didn't surprise me, really. <laughs> As um, coming from I, me yeah, or yeah, didn't surprise yeah. me in general? No, no, it didn't surprise me because it came from you. Um, and we know each other well enough to, to, have, to have understood each other in, in reading that. Um, I think that, I mean, obviously, what is going on in the Middle East is a, a serious issue, and we, we acknowledge that. I think what Alex has just said is quite interesting, but I, I'm not sure that's quite where the British public is, to be honest. I think... Where, where are they? Well, when I'm out and about, and I was yesterday in Lansing, which is part of uh, Tim Lawton's uh, constituency in East Worthing and Shoreham, and in being there, lots and lots of people came out to talk to Labour members who were out knocking on doors. And they were basically saying that they had had enough and they want to get on with a general election. And I think... Uh, with, what... with any expectation that things will change? Well, that's probably the key thing from a, a Labour point of view, is how on earth will we be able, in a very different uh, financial situation than the one we had in 1997, for instance, how on earth would we be able to do all the things that everyone wants? And one of the things that I've said in various interviews with people is you're going to have to be patient. You know, there's lots of things that people would like to, to see done in Britain, but it's going to take time. I mean, West Treating was just on with Camilla, and, you know, it's three-quarters of a billion more for this and three-quarters of a billion less for that or whatever. Yeah. It, it isn't talking about major reform. I mean, I feel like we need to pick the thing up and shake it by, by the lapels. Do you not feel that? Well, the NHS certainly needs support, and it's not had that for some years. I think we could all probably acknowledge that. And part of that is going to be finance. How we do that, I think, is a difficult area. Um, and I just think that at some point in the next few months, depending on when the general election is, I think there will be some more to come from the Labour Party because we need to do that and have that ready for people. Aubrey, any more support for Portillo from you or are you going to take the same toad as the others? I think that it's not uncommon for opposition politicians over the last few years to have been calling for a general election. Um, they sort of did that in the aftermath of Boris Johnson's resignation when obviously there was a new Prime Minister installed without one. But I do feel as though the sort of the tone has changed. Normally people just look to their politicians and say, we just want you to get the job done. Frankly, we're not too fussed about exactly who it is, so long as the delivery is the central focus. I think in the next sort of nine months, in the build-up to the general election, that will change. There will be an impatience. People will become frustrated and find that this sort of slightly long, drawn-out process of the general election probably being held back to November will exacerbate some of the concerns that you raised. And that's, I think, the danger for Rishi Sunak, that he looks like he's sort of holding back and not allowing people to finally have their vote. We're watching live pictures of Keir Starmer, who's presently at the Jewish uh, Labour Movement, addressing an audience in today. North London. Jewish Labour Movement. Um, so, um, Aubrey, uh, I mean, you're a young person, and I, I hope you don't have to make use very much of the National Health Service, but, I mean, are you aware of what people are going through at the moment, that they're told they have to call up on a Monday morning at 8 o'clock to try and get a, an appointment, which will probably be a virtual appointment with the doctor, and if they're unsuccessful in this lottery, they're sort of just kicked back for another week and told to try again the following Monday? I mean, can, can we believe the level of collapse in public services which has occurred in this country? Absolutely. Um, it's something that I speak to my friends about last night. I spoke to a woman who was saying that she had to wait 42 weeks for an operation for something. Um, whenever, I mean, I tried to register for a dental um, appointment at a surgery because I've moved to the area recently. Completely impossible as far as I can tell. All of the practices nearby don't seem to be accepting new NHS patients. So the sort of, it's not really a postcode lottery anymore because it doesn't sound as though very many people are successful mm. in, in sort of... Uh, 
sort of successfully accessing the, the health service and the various routes into it. Obviously, a Labour government is going to be asked a lot about how they'd reform it. It has to sort of be wary about being drawn into the just throw more man money at it problem because the Conservatives will attack it and say that they, the spending on the NHS has risen by a third since 2010. So Labour, Labour needs to be more surgical, if you like, about how they talk about improving the NHS. I think one of the things just to look back at in, the, in that 97 to 2007 period, that 10 years, where we did actually get numbers right down <laughs> So people waiting for cancer treatment weren't waiting weeks and weeks. They were waiting up to 7 to 14 days. Mm. Let me and that's the sort of thing where, where I think we need to get back to. Sorry. I, I, want to, I don't want to move the subject on, uh, taking advantage of the fact you're here. I haven't yeah. forgotten you're there, Alex. I have a yeah. captain. Uh, how do you feel about the, uh, the business with the Houthis this morning? Oh, I thought we were absolutely right to do what we've been doing. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you'll recall, uh, Michael, when we were both in the Commons, that one of the things we did in 2003 was to start the thing where Parliament could vote on issues. So to go to Iraq, we actually did that uh, in, in that period of time. And I'm sure on Monday there will be, you know, good response to what uh, um, the RAF did on, um, on Friday night. I think that was the right thing to do, absolutely. Um, Alex, you might agree it was the right thing to do. Any nervousness? Um, no, not least because I think Labour will back the government. Um, so, or in British political uh, terms, no nervousness. I do, of course, like everyone, worry about escalation in the region. But I think, on the other hand, you know, people talk about this as if uh, it's war on the Houthis or war on Yemen. Yemen has a sovereign government, and that sovereign government is largely in exile. Mm. Uh, and uh, Rashad al uh, Alimi, who leads their uh, um, president's leadership council, chairs it, um, hasn't yet spoken out about which position he takes. But of course, if they take a position, it'll be. Can you do more? Because the clue's in the name. The Houthi rebels are not the government of Yemen. They act as if they are. They bombard others in international waters as if they are. But they are a, revol a revolutionary movement that sought to seize power from the legitimate government in Yemen. And part of the reason our European allies are currently sitting things out is that a UN member state, Yemen, hasn't asked us to help yet. But they may. And so the prospect in the coming weeks might be if finally um, the, the legitimate government of Yemen asks for assistance, then you see France and Italy and Germany and so forth joining in in what so far has been British and American led. Um, Aubrey, there, there's no particular domestic political danger here. Labour and Conservatives are absolutely at one and on the same page. However, what do you think about the strategic dangers of it? So I suppose that the main concern is that there is going to be demonstrations for and against the uh, military action and the worry, I think, in government is that that sort of sparks um, a sort of debate and heated exchanges, the likes we've seen in, in the sort of aftermath of uh, Hamas's invasion of Israel, which then caused real um, turbulence and um, division amongst the British public. And I think that's the main concern, not necessarily the sort of cross-party support for military action, but the consequences that flow from it in the UK and whether or not this further exacerbates the sort of divides we've seen over the last well, few weeks. I want to share a thought with Ivor, yeah, which yeah. is because we were both in the Ministry of Defence. Yeah. The feeling of inadequacy that you have because you're being asked to make impossible decisions with enormous consequences. And what training have you had? Because by and large, people who go into British politics have not had the long training in international affairs, affairs that maybe a Winston Churchill had yeah. in times gone by. And trying to weigh up, you know, Houthis and other Yemenis, or trying to weigh up the, the considerations of Taiwan and China, uh, decisions for which you're ill-prepared. I just want a moment of kind of sympathy yeah. for the people who are going through this at a the moment. Absolutely, Michael, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I did go through a process in my first three days in the ministry in uh, June that, that 2003, and, and it was about training and understanding what you do and be ready for all the possible consequences. This, of course, is post 9-11. So the, 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 the kind of level that you went through with uh, the, the people who were helping you was so that you could undertake that. And, you know, I can think of times when we'd get a call which would say, there's, a, there's an aeroplane in it coming into our skies and we can't get communication with them. So then you've got to know what to do. That sounds very simple. Turned out to be a a sadly fatal captain who had passed away with a heart attack. So, you know, there, those sort of things do happen, but they've got to be dealt with properly. And I think that over these last, you know, five, ten years, maybe we've lost that ability to do. 
I think, it, you know, the, the Ministry of Defence, particularly under Ben Wallace, was doing a really great job. Michael, if, uh, I, if I may... I very I, briefly, Alice. Of course, I listened. Uh, Aubrey is right that one of the results we may be concerned about is demonstrations on the streets, but this is one of the things that affects my morale, the idea that British Liberals, because it's anti-American, anti-British, celebrate the cause of Houthi rebels who enslave people and massacre people in their country. They are finding alliance with the most absurd individuals and not seeing the hypocrisy and, and, and wrongness of that. That's something that affects my morale. But Alex, but, doesn't uh, this happen oh, all the time? Me. Sorry, I was just going to say that happens all sure. the time. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Uh, uh, you've been a marvellous uh, panel. Thank you very much for coming in on Sunday morning. So that was Ivor Kaplan, Aubrey Allegretti and Alex Dean. In a few minutes I'll be joined by a Ukrainian journalist who's done so much to keep British readers informed of events in her country. Svetlana Moronets of The Spectator magazine will join me in the studio in a few moments. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Rishi Sunak was in Kiev this week to make Britain's largest pledge 
to date of aid for Ukraine, two and a half billion pounds to help the country fight off the brutal Russian invasion that began when Putin seized Crimea in 2014 before the full-scale invasion of two years ago. Svetlana Moronets is a Ukrainian journalist whose weekly newsletters and reporting in The Spectator magazine have informed readers of the crucial developments in her home country. I'm very pleased that she now joins me to give her opinion of what to expect from the war in 2024. Welcome to GB News. Thank you. Um, first of all, what will be the reaction in Ukraine to the two and a half billion pound package announced by Rishi Sunak and the security guarantees? Of course, everybody, everybody in Ukraine is very pleased from this news because uh, the end of the last year was quite depressing for Ukraine. Uh, taking into account the situation in the front line that Russians have taken the initiative and also that there is a threat of the American aid drain up. Uh, that's why to see the United Kingdom supporting us so much, it means a lot. And it also gives us hope that uh, other allies will follow, that maybe Rishi Sunak has set a trend. And uh, because uh, Ukraine, of course, is not going to join NATO anytime soon. So we need some other deals uh, with our allies to ensure that they are going to keep helping us uh, to fight Russian invasion. President Zelensky described the package and the security guarantees as unprecedented. Do we know what the guarantees consist of? Yes, it is the uh, intelligence exchange and also the supply of weapons and uh, joint military the production of weapons and training of Ukrainian soldiers. And also, if uh, when the war ends, if Russia invades Ukraine again, that means that the UK will support Ukraine uh, again with weapons and other stuff. I think you referred there to the difficult end of last year for Ukraine and the feeling that Russia took the initiative. Do you want to say a bit more about whether Russia does have the initiative now? Right now, they are in the offence along the eastern front line. And uh, both armies, they can't advance because of the scale of the minefields and because of the amount of drones that, re that there are right now. And also, Ukraine needs reinforcements. Uh, our soldiers are tired. Many of them have been fighting for almost two years without any break. That's why the topic of conscription is the main issue in Ukraine today and our government is trying to uh, implement the new regulations and call up more people because Russia uh, reinforces its army all the time. They don't stop conscription and we, has, we have to do the same. Our army is much smaller and we have much less people right now. Tell me about the debate in Ukraine at the moment about conscription. The problem is, is that uh, Russia doesn't play by the rules. Putin can just forget about any human rights and call up people and threat them if they're going to be imprisoned or something else. But as Ukraine was to be a part of the democratic community, uh, we have to make the regulations fair for everyone. And the debate right now, uh, they want to, the government wants to lock down the conscription age from 27 to 25 years old, and also to implement stricter uh, sanctions for men who try to evade the conscription. And the question right now it is what those sanctions will be, because uh, some of them were like men who are caught trying to flee the conscription. Uh, they will be not just imprisoned, but they will lose the rights of their property of their uh, c cars, house, and I don't think that they are going to actually implement that because it's not what democratic country would do. So they are trying to find a way so not to make it so harsh, but at the same time to call up more people. Uh, also, they are thinking about strategy about recruited, re recruiting people. It means that people can choose uh, in what brigade they're going to serve, uh, what profession there they want to take. So it will give them more freedom and where they feel more comfortable. It, you have to understand that conscription doesn't mean that in one month they will be in Bakhmut. Uh, we need a lot of uh, people in supplies, uh, in uh, 
for our medics, to help for our medics, for uh, cyber security and other stuff. So it doesn't mean that all of them will go to fight tomorrow. And also, uh, it's better to start early and they will have more time to receive the training in Ukraine or in other countries. What are you expecting on the battlefield from the Russians? Where are you expecting them to advance, if they can? Uh, the most uh, difficult situation right now uh, in Avdiivka, they have been trying to encircle this city like for eight months already. They can't, but uh, it's there the, where we have become, began losing ground. It's slowly, it's like meter after meter, but they're advancing, you know, and, this, and also around Kupiansky in Kharkiv region. Do you fear a new front um, to the north, uh, maybe uh, a new initiative coming through Belarus by the Russians? According to Ukrainian Defense Ministry, there are in Belarus there are right now 19,000 Russian soldiers, and they say it is not enough for making another offensive. Right. And U Ukrainian government, they start, uh, started to build fortifications along the state border with Belarus and also along the front line. And I think it will be the main focus this year to prepare for a long defensive fight, to build the fortifications and also to boost the domestic weapons production. Uh, because even we have to be sure that if some countries don't want to help us anymore, that we can produce our weapons. And, but for that, we need air defense systems because Russia doesn't stop shelling us every day. They launch hundreds of missiles and drones. And recently they have started to attack our airfields, expecting that F-16s are going to arrive in spring or summer. So we need to protect our airfields too. Uh, thank you very much, Svetlana. Um, and congratulations on all you've been doing with your work at The Spectator, keeping us very well informed about what's going on. Thank you. And I would like to thank from all Ukrainian people for the United Kingdom for supporting us. It means a lot for us. <laughs> thank you. Svetlana Moronets. Um, history will be made later today when Denmark's longest serving head of state will hand the throne over to her son. Queen Margrethe II is the first Danish monarch in 900 years to abdicate. Our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker, has the details. I've decided that now is the right time. On the 14th of January 2024, 52 years after I succeeded my beloved father, I will step down as Queen of Denmark. Denmark's 83-year-old Queen's shock announcement took millions of Danes by surprise. For the first time in 900 years of Danish history, the monarch will abdicate after half a century as the country's longest serving head of state. Queen Margrethe and Queen Elizabeth were distant cousins, both descending from Queen Victoria. And in 2022, she welcomed our future queen, Princess Catherine, to the royal palace, who was on a fact-finding mission for her early years' work. It's uh, wonderful to see them when it's on stage and to see them using the costumes and the, and the scenery that I've designed. Queen Margaret is admired for her tactile and creative personality. We really like what she stands for, how she represents Denmark. It's really nice to see that it goes beyond the politics and so on. But recent years have not been smooth sailing. Her Majesty removed the prince and princess titles from her grandchildren born to her second son. She hoped it would help them shape their own lives without the pressure of royal titles. But the spare wasn't happy. Prince Joachim publicly spoke out against his mother's decision. Remind you of anyone? It's not just Prince Harry who's talked about family dramas. In February, the Queen had extensive surgery on her back. Her long period of recovery meant her eldest son, Crown Prince Frederick, took on her duties. Today, he does so permanently as Denmark's new king. His wife and new queen, Australian-born Princess Mary, has thrilled Aussies down under. What a great ambassador for Australia. Proud of her. Yeah, terrific, it's lovely. Terrific yeah. news. She deserves it. And She's she lovely. She carries herself extremely well. Mm. I'm very proud. I'm very excited. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I think she'll make a great queen. At 18, Prince Christian will become Denmark's heir to the throne, taking over his father's role as the crown prince. Prince Frederick will ascend the throne this afternoon, 
after his mother signs a declaration of her abdication. Cameron Walker, GB News. Cameron Walker reporting. During the Africa campaign of World War II, Major Mike Sadler was one of the first men to sign up to a new crack regiment of hardened but innovative soldiers tasked with disrupting General Rommel's Africa Corps by any means necessary. They were, of course, the SAS. He was not, as has been widely reported, one of the original 66 men who were recruited into the SAS in the summer of 1941. He joined slightly later from another unit called the Long Range Desert Group. Sadler, who some of his colleagues have suggested might never have fired a shot in the Africa campaign, navigated the soldiers through the Libyan desert to attack German air airfields behind enemy lines, using maritime navigational skills dating back to the great British adventurers Drake and Raleigh. He died on the 4th of January, aged 103. Joining me to discuss his life is Gavin Mortimer, author of two SAS, Bill Sterling and the Forgotten Special Forces Unit of World War II. Um, Gavin, it's great to speak to you. Um, tell us about these navigational techniques. This was obviously what was particular about Sadler. How did he acquire those skills and how did he apply them? Good morning, Michael. Yes, he, he was a, a brilliant navigator, first for the Long Range Desert Group, and then he was actually headhunted by David Sterling, the founder of the SAS, in early 1942. But Mike, who I, I knew, uh, I first interviewed Mike in 2002 and really stayed in contact uh, and interviewed him on several other occasions. Um, and and he, as, he, as he told me, he was a hopeless mathematician at school, but he just took to, to navigation. And the uh, the, the chap in the Long Range Desert Group, uh, who was the master navigator, was a, a man called Tom Merrick, who in the 1930s had been a merchant seaman. And it was he who taught Mike how to use the stars to navigate. Um, and they also had something called a sun compass, which is uh, an invention of Ralph Bagnold, who was the founder of the Long Range Desert Group. And uh, he's actually a World War I uh, veteran, Michael, but he uh, was stationed in Egypt into war years. And and developed uh, a real um, thirst for exploring the, the Libyan desert, which no European had done before. And the Sun Compass was um, a, a disc marked 360 degrees. It had a, a vertical needle and a horizontal needle, and you navigated using the sun shadow. Um, so it was actually quite simple to use, as, as Mike told me. And um, uh, But I think the, the most important thing um, for navigating in the desert was confidence. And um, there's a quote Mike told me here. He said, one of the essential things was not to let doubt creep into your mind. You had to be confident because it was awfully easy, especially at night when you could be tired and start to feel you were going wrong further left, further right. You had to be sure of yourself. And I think that was Mike's <clears throat> great strength. He had a really strong um, uh, mindset. I mean, let's put this in context. So they'd be travelling tens of miles, maybe 70 miles across the desert. There's sim there are simply no landmarks whatsoever, and they've got to arrive precisely at a German airfield and hopefully precisely at the right moment. So that is the navigational challenge. What kind of things did they do when they got there? Well, um, you're quite right, uh, uh, Michael. And one of the, uh, Mike's finest moments in the SAS was the night of July the 26th, 1942, when they raided... Sidi Yanesh airfield in Libya. And they were based, the SAS, uh, in a remote desert outpost uh, in a wadi, a dried riverbed. And it was 70 miles north to the target. As you said, they were traveling at night. Um, and um, Mike navigated using the stars. And they were about a mile or so from, it was just a landing strip on, on the desert, the hard gravel, flat surface of a desert. And David Sterling, who was leading, he, he, that was beginning to enter his mind. And he said to Mike, where are we? Uh, I can't see or, or hear anything. And Mike said, we're here, we're here, it's just ahead. And then at that moment, suddenly the desert was illuminated by the lights of this landing strip. And in came a German, Hunk, German Heinkel bomber. And Mike turned to David, uh, David Sterling and said, there we are, never doubt me. And then they raided the airfield there are 18 jeeps in, in total, in two columns. And in that raid, they drove very slowly. It was very disciplined. They drove onto the airfield. The left-hand column 
firing out at one row of uh, parked German bombers, the right-hand column, the other. And in a, the space of a few minutes, they damaged or destroyed 30 enemy aircraft. And, and that was so crucial in the Desert War, Michael, because it was hard for the Germans to bring um, a spare planes and spare parts over the Mediterranean to North Africa. And part of what they were doing also, I believe, was killing pilots. Yeah, well, that was that was in particular Paddy Main, um, who, contrary to some uh, the, the BBC drama Rogue Heroes last year, um, which was you know it was it was entertaining, uh, it was five out of ten for historical accuracy. Where they really got it wrong was a character of Paddy Main, who was a, a, a lawyer by training, a, a rugby international before the war, and he wasn't this mindless thug. He was a very as Michael Sadler was. Uh, was a great admirer of, of Paddy Main. And he actually drove, Mike Sadler navigated Paddy Main to his first raid, Tamit Airfield, in December 1941. Uh, and on that raid, uh, Paddy Main and five men destroyed 24 aircraft. And they also saw a thin strip of light uh, from under a door. Paddy Main kicked open the door, and inside were about 30 German aircrew. And he said in this quiet Irish brogue, good evening, gentlemen, and they opened fire and they killed them. Now, OK, that was callous, but it, it, they were combatants. And this was, uh, um, again, depriving Germany. You, you, can, you can ship over spare parts eventually, but to train a new pilot takes many, many months. And that was, that was so crucial about this type of warfare. It was, it was materially effective and also psychologically effective because the Germans and the Italians never felt safe, even miles behind any, but behind their own lines. Uh, thank you very much, Gavin Mortimer, for coming on and paying tribute to uh, Michael Sadler, who died at the beginning of this year. After the break, Stefan Kiriazis will be here to give us his first theatre reviews of the year. Stay with us, please. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. During the break, the spectral Stefan Kiriazis <laughs> has assumed human form in the studio. He looks as though he's seen a ghost. And <laughs> after his review, we will feel as though we attended the theatre with him in <laughs> spirit. Ta-da. Very good. A way of saying that you've been seeing some plays about ghosts. Yeah, it's all very spine-chilling. It's all going on at the moment. And it, it's kicking off in London with Catherine Tate in The Enfield Haunting, which is on at the Ambassador's Theatre until March. And this is a true story, mm -hmm. also very true, is we critics are moving as a pack again. Lots of one and two stars. Um, one comment was, um, well, hopefully at least it means we've seen the worst play of the year already. No. Yes, and my esteemed colleague at The Express, I think, said this show needs an exorcism. So, true what, story. A, a show with Catherine Tate, that's... Mm. Uh, huh. Yes, and she was marvellous in Much Ado with David Tennant in Shakespeare. She was fantastic on stage, but this is a dramatic role. Uh, and true story, 1977 to 79 in Enfield, a house was possessed, made the national news, investigators came in, two of them actually stayed on and off with the family. Young girl Janet, 11 in real life, she's been aged up for this, um, and her sister Margaret, Janet was possessed, and about 30 people said they'd seen evidence. Uh, so we have a play that has to give us all of this. Yeah. Uh, it does a lot of the kind of blacking out, so it all goes very black, there's lots of rumbling, and then you get a flash of light and a girl appears to be floating, or you get a flash of what could be a mysterious figure or something like that. And it's effective, especially in the earlier stages. Exciting to do in the theatre, because of course you can do that in movies, but it's a yeah. big challenge to do it yeah. in the theatre. But this is something that classical, traditional theatre mm -hmm. has always been very good at. You don't mm -hmm. need screens and special effects. Uh, it's a drama. Now, number one, we have Catherine Tate. I don't know dramatic range how much there is, but also we are so familiar with her and her face, and, you know, a lot of her characters are about mugging. So when she's making a bit of an exaggerated face, it gets laughs, and it shouldn't. Um, so there were there are laughs at moments. The script is not great. Paul Unwin has written the script, um, and it's, it's not brilliantly worded. There's not a lot of tension. The neighbour is like a 1960s black character from a 1960s sitcom. It's just very awkward. Um, mm. And you've got to have... The, the, the main actress has got to do the kind of poltergeist voice and all the head rolling and whatever, and that's tricky to pull off. Where is this? This is on at the Ambassadors. I would say this one is uh, a turkey. It's about as real as... There's a plastic teapot. It's about as real as the plastic teapot, I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay. However... Um, tell us about 222, which I mm. think is how you pronounce it, isn't it? It is. So, I we would say... Has the genre given up the ghost, Michael? No, it has not. 222, a ghost story. Uh, very successful West End run. We know that I wasn't a massive fan the first time round, especially with Lily Allen in the lead, and that might have been a big part of it. But I went back with Cheryl Cole um, and really enjoyed it. And actually, it's a play, there's a lot of layers, and this shows how to do this sort of thing. A lot of tension. There's a proper family drama in this one, proper relationship dramas, which the other tries to do and lacks. Um, and actually... There's a lot of melancholy under it, and there's a lot about class, a lot about relationships. The twist is great, uh, and it's fun to watch the second time and see if you can spot the but, clues. But the newness is that this is touring. This is touring. It's currently about to go into the Birmingham Alexandra Theatre next week, touring all the way through, to, through till June, um, and they're expecting to announce more dates. Jay McGuinness, boy band member of The Wanted, is the lead, with Vera Chock taking the main female role. And this one I thoroughly recommend. It's entertaining... A few scares, but actually more depth than I admit I saw the first time round. So, recommended. And you've even found a ballet for us which has ghostly elements. I have. We've got Giselle from the English National Ballet. We're on a theme tonight and we've got a gorgeous, gorgeous clip to have a look at. Let's look at it. <laughs>
being able to show stuff like that. Uh, are we all GB stirred, news. beautiful? Adolf Adam, gorgeous music. Mary Skeeping, it says there, is the choreographer. It's 1971, but it's back from the 1840s, the original French, and she restored a lot of it. So this is as traditional as ballet gets. Uh, and I love a lot of the modern stuff, but this is sumptuous and often very slow. And it's all about details and it's gorgeously, gorgeously danced. You can see there, it starts in a kind of flurry of joyous, bucolic countryside. We're in a little village, beautiful young village girl, the Giselle of the title. She loves to dance, but she has a heart problem. Uh, and she's being wooed by a handsome chap who is actually turns out to be a bit of a bounder. He's a local nobleman. nobleman in disguise, already engaged to someone else. Um, and what I love about actually all three of the things we're we've talked about so far, they're very female-centric. It's the women that are driving all of these plots. And the end of Act One is hugely tragic after all this joyous dancing. And then we go, which you saw there, to the woods. Um, and that's where we encounter the villies, which are the vengeful spirits of wronged women. And they haunt these woods, they terrorize any men that come in, they kind of, they can make them dance themselves to death um, and literally give people the willies. And I, th I actually, I thought, I was wondering where does this come from? So, and I've always wondered if it was a slightly more literal term. It's about scratchy, itchy underwear that was worn by American frontiersmen. So there's your info bit of the day. That is a brilliant That's piece where of the trivia. phrase comes from. But anyway, now wait a minute. So first of all, you, you think it's very good? It's beautifully danced. You saw that, especially when we get the villies floating up on point in their beautiful diaphanous dresses. It's like a mirage. It's gorgeous. And secondly, it's also available nationally in some sense. Um, this one at the moment is only on at the Coliseum. OK, can, um, we, can we see it? The English National do tour. They haven't announced yet on this one. Um, it is, I think you can find it online as well, but it's absolutely stunning, sumptuous and beautiful. I will be there. Yes. Um, tell us about the coming programme for the mm. National Theatre, the Royal enough. National Theatre. Yes, hurrah for them. And we've got a lovely little clip here to give you a taste of what's to come. To be or not to be. Ah, the question. This is a story, and you are the storytellers! This feels like a different England. Everybody here? Well, I recognise some of those. The yes. motive in the queue and this England. Mm. Uh, what's new at the National Theatre? So the joy for this is, this is all in cinema. So this is absolutely nationwide. That's this. We, it's out to the nation. You can go and see all of these. And also, wonderfully, sometimes, the cinema, you get to see so much. Doesn't, you know, you might not have the best seat sometimes, but in the cinema, it's all right there. And we're close up. And we're kicking off with Dear England on January 25th. That's the Gareth Southgate football story. Thrilling. I loved it. Not a football fan. Absolutely loved it. So wear your, your scarves and your, your, your branded hats and everything and take a banner along for England. Uh, it's exciting theatre and I imagine it's going to be really fun in the cinema as well. And then very different from that, Vanya, which is the Andrew Scott, that's the one-man version of Uncle Vanya, which has been garlanded with awards and nominations. And I'd be really interested to see that up close because it's him on the stage all the time and he is magnetic in it. But to be able to see this on a big screen, um, because he's flitting between all these characters with <coughs> just a tilt of the head or a flip of glasses or a different piece of a necklace that he plays with. But to see it that intensely on the cinema is going to be really, really exciting. The other one that's, that's coming out is Motive in the Queue, which has just been in the West End again. Um, that's the Gil Good, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor one. Mark Gatiss, you saw the clip there. I mean... You... Uh, yes, so, so, so to be clear, it's about Richard Burton's performance mm. as Hamlet in New York, directed by John Gilgood, yep. and the tension between the two men. Yeah. Uh, and you wonder how it was that they managed to put on such a successful production because it ran and ran and ran and it ran. It was the longest what running. It was obviously the fantastic uh, tension between them. But that's when you get the greatness and also the melancholy of the past and the future and the present and also the fact that we then knew that Gilgood would go on to kind of revive his career. It's beautifully done and Gatiss is stunning. And then there is one new one at the end, which we haven't seen yet, Nye, which is Michael Sheen as Bevan. Um, uh, Nye Bevan. Yeah, Nye Bevan. And that is not out until 
February the 24th in theatres, cinema April the 23rd, so come to London or see it nationwide on cinemas. And I'd just um, like to say that even if you have seen a, a play in the theatre or an opera in the theatre, the experience of going mm. to see it in the cinema is well worth doing as well because you see all these other aspects. You yes. see people close up, you see the way in which the shots have been framed. Stefan Kiriazis, thank you very much indeed. That concludes the first part of the programme, but stray not. I'll be back in a few minutes to discuss the role of television drama in the post office scandal. See you then. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. Today is a transition day in terms of our weather types. We are finally seeing this northerly flow of air stream its way in from the Arctic, bringing a cold plunge of air. Ahead of it though, we do have some cold fronts, so that's bringing a fair amount of cloud just to southern areas of the UK. Not too much rainfall on it, but some spots of drizzle are possible over the course of the afternoon. Further to the north though, some brighter skies, but also the showers starting to stream their way in across northern areas of Scotland, and in the cold air they will be falling as snow, even to lower levels. Feeling very cold here, two, three degrees Celsius, feeling colder than that though, with some very strong winds with severe gales for a time across Shetland. That northerly plunge of air continues to push its way southwards as we head throughout this evening and overnight, actually having to clear out some of this cloud across southern areas of England and Wales. But with widespread clear skies developing overnight, it was going to turn widely frosty for all of us. A very cold night indeed, and the risk of some icy stretches where we continue to see those showers feeding in across northern Scotland and increasingly into northern Ireland as well. Into Monday, we might see a few sleet showers for the far west of Wales, southwest England, and maybe some skirting coast of Yorkshire down into Norfolk as well. But head further inland, widespread clear blue skies, a lot of sunshine, but still feeling very cold, one, two Celsius at best. But a very chilly wind along eastern coastal areas will make it feel sub-freezing. And the cold persists throughout next week with more disruptive snow possible on Tuesday. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays, eight till nine on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Michael Portillo, an afternoon amble through arts, culture, politics and world affairs. To start off this hour, I'll look at the post office scandal that caused decades of injustice, humiliation and anxiety for hundreds of sub-postmasters. I'll ask my panellists which institutions have been most tarnished by the controversy and discuss the role of television drama in bringing justice. In Taiwan, national elections have led to the uh, election of the Democratic Progressive Party for a third successive term. The result will have profound implications for the future of the island, as well as the relationship between China and the United States. Professor Rana Mitter of Harvard University is one of the foremost experts of modern Chinese history, and he'll join me to analyse the result. Across the Irish Sea, a Sinn Féin politician has had a libel action thrown out of court. Jerry Kelly, who was convicted of the Old Bailey bombing in 1973, sued journalist Malachi O'Doherty for comments in a radio interview in a suit that the judge described as scandalous and vexatious. Sinn Féin, which could become the governing party in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, has denied trying to intimidate journalists through the courts. Malachi O'Doherty will join me to discuss his case. And as the British Museum recruits a new director, I'll ask what should be the priorities of this embattled institution with an archaeologist and a lawyer who's representing the Greek government in its legal action over the Parthenon marbles. All of that to come. First, your first, but first, your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thanks, Michael. It is one minute past 12. Good afternoon to you, Aaron Armstrong, here in the GB Newsroom. The number of migrants who died trying to cross the English Channel overnight has risen to five. French officials say a small boat carrying dozens of people got into difficulties just off a beach north of the port of Boulogne. A huge rescue effort took place uh, with French maritime vessels, a helicopter and emergency services combing the area at Wimereux. A further two migrant boats arrived in the UK waters this morning and at least 100 people have been taken to Dover. The Foreign Secretary has warned the Houthis of further strikes in Yemen if attacks in the Red Sea continue. Lord Cameron says the UK has sent an unambiguous message but will continue to back words with action. Writing in The Telegraph, he says disruption in the Red Sea threatens vital supply chains which could force up prices in Britain. Defence Procurement Minister James Cartledge says the UK-US joint strikes were necessary. The Houthis were um, attacking international shipping from many countries. They've been doing so since November. Wholly uh, unjustified, in indiscriminate attacks which put lives at risk, let alone the economic consequences. And of course, ultimately, they attacked a British naval vessel, HMS Diamond, which put us in the position where the Prime Minister concluded, uh, concluded that he had no choice but to act in the manner that he did. Well, the government's facing calls for a retrospective vote on strikes against the Houthis. Shadow Cabinet Minister Wes Streeting says while parliamentary approval should be sought in most armed interventions, 
there are exceptions. Keir's been, I think, very clear about the fact that you would want to have a vote in Parliament before military action takes place, particularly when it comes to the deployment of troops. Mm. There will always be circumstances in which government has to act quickly and decisively and without reference to Parliament. And that's why Keir Starmer would have made exactly the same decision. A record 420,000 patients had to wait more than 12 hours in A&E last year. The latest NHS England figures show one in 15 patients faced so-called trolley waits, which have been linked to excess deaths and increased harm to patients. The number also reflects a 20% increase on 2022. Lib Dem leader Sir Ed Davies accusing the Prime Minister of driving the health service into the ground. An Arctic blast is to hit the UK, prompting weather warnings. Uh, Northern, uh, Northern Scotland could see up to 10 centimetres of snow today and it will be a similar situation in Northern Ireland tomorrow. The freezing temperatures are forecast to move further south over the course of the week. That will affect parts of Northern England. Roads and railways are likely to be disrupted. A new analysis shows the majority of injuries caused by e-scooter crashes go unreported. A government study has found fewer than 10% of casualties treated at hospital have been reported to the police. Private e-scooters cannot be legally ridden on roads or pavements, but they have become a common sight, particularly in cities. 11 riders and one pedestrian died in e-scooter crashes in Britain in 2022, and almost 1,500 people were injured. Sat-navs are to be updated with the latest driving data that's under new government plans. Until now, traffic regulation orders, like temporary speed limits or road closures, were not automatically updated on the digital systems. But the new rules mean valuable data, like location of parking spaces, will now be available. And a volcano is erupting again in southwest Iceland. Lava, which can be seen spewing into the air and out of the fissure, is said to be flowing uh, towards the town of Grindavik, which has been evacuated for a second time. Residents were also forced to leave their homes last month. The country's president says no lives are in danger, but infrastructure may be under threat. It's the fifth eruption on the peninsula since 2021. This is GB News. We're live on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker too. That's it for me. Now back to Michael. Thank you, Aaron Armstrong. Although the former chief executive of the post office, Paula Vanells, has handed back her CBE, there have been no serious sanctions for those who brought about the broadest miscarriage of justice in modern British history. Hundreds of sub-postmasters were wrongly accused of theft and false accounting, imprisoned or driven out of business and into bankruptcy, thanks to faults in a computer system that the post office refused to acknowledge. It's a controversy that has tarred many of this country's institutions. Which of them are the most tarnished? Why has a television drama been more effective than Parliament or journalism in driving a soporific government to act? To discuss that, I'm joined by Stephen Barrett, a barrister and writer, and Paul Conyu, the former editor of the Sunday Mirror. Thank you very much for joining us. Paul, let me start with you. Why has it taken a TV drama to drive the government into effective action? A huge, a huge question. A brilliantly acted, brilliantly written TV drama, but in reality, it told us nothing that hadn't been put into the public domain before. The media could have done better, I accept, but the media are probably the least blameworthy here, because I've been doing some research and there are well over 200 local newspaper articles over the years about this individual basis. Why did it take the, the, the judiciary, part politicians, with some honourable exceptions, not to get their teeth into this? Where were the Lord Chancellor's office? When, when, how could you not realise, hang on a minute, there are hundreds and hundreds of Postmasters and postmistresses with impeccable past records who suddenly there's a pandemic of dishonesty, they've all turned rogue and villain, and no one, fig no one figured this. And in defense of the media, saying we could have done better to, to, to an extent, but Computer Weekly back in 
back in in 29. You've, you, you, you've also, you also had private eyes starting in 2011, even regularly doing it, even in 2020, running a whole magazine, you know, on justice in the post or injustice in the post. And, and then you've had panora two big panoramas. You've, you've actually, with that very good PC journalist, Nick Wallace, who's written a, a, a tremendous book in 2021. So it was in the public domain, and, it, and the producers and writers of the programme admit that they relied to, to a lot in their research on, 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 media, on media articles and broadcasts. So this is a massive failure. And I just wonder, being a cynic, I just wonder if it wasn't an election year, whether the whether Parliament would be reacting the way that it had and the government would be reacting the way it is now. Well, I think you've made a number of interesting points there. Stephen, uh, what I want to focus on is, is the here and now, because this, this thing has been exposed over many, many years. But it, it now turns out that in the government's view, it can take effective action. It can introduce primary legislation. Well, that's never been on the agenda before. Why has it taken the TV drama to achieve that? And why has the TV drama been effective where members of parliament and journalists somehow were not as effective before? Well, I think that there's two points to that. And on the TV drama being effective, what I would say is that the media play a vital constitutional role in our country. They always have the free, free press. Or the Victorians acknowledged that they are vital. That's why we have press galleries in, in, in parliament, because the, the press have a vital constitutional role. Mm. They shine a light on it. They do bring attention to things, which is what they've done here. Now, on the secondary point of, of why has Parliament suddenly discovered it has powers, we are living through a period in which our constitution is being restored. So as a country, we, when we were members of the EU, our constitution is largely suppressed and the EU runs things and we, we function as a different type of state. By leaving the EU, we return to a pre-EU state and, and, and we go back to our old style constitution. And under our old style constitution, you're quite right, direct, uh, direct acts of parliament. You know, parliament can actually do things. Government can do stuff. I, I mean, I had to go in and talk to a committee of MPs to explain the constitution to them to, and explain that they had power. They, they seem to have forgotten that they have power, but they, they genuinely do. You know, parliament is the seat of all power in our country and they're slowly coming back to the realization that they can do things, and this government is now passing legislation to deal with this, this national scandal. It is, it is more, I think, than just a perversion of justice. It, it, it is a grotesque scandal, this one. Yeah. It, it does seem to me that quite a few people are culpable in at least turning a blind eye to it. 25, well, 26 years. But back in 1999, <laughs> under pressure from the post office, in fact, the law was changed so that computers were seen as virtually infallible unless you pr produced concrete proof. They were, they were wrong, they were in error. That, to me, is, is a perversion of our judicial system. It, it, it basically said, prove your innocence, not, you know, not, not innocent Absolutely. until it, proven guilty. It swings the thing. Uh, and, Paul, I want to raise this with Stephen. You, you made the point earlier that, in a way, perhaps we're all guilty, uh, and I would certainly include myself here, you read all the reports and you feel indignant about the postmasters, but watching this drama is a harrowing experience. Mm. I mean, people are sitting in their living rooms fighting back tears as they're watching this drama. So maybe that's the thing. It is simply that it has got to us. It's got absolutely into us because it is shown in dramatic form. Yes, and it's shattering this illusion that we are all sort of um, just units, just that, that we're just uh, pieces on a game board to, to be used and manipulated and, and moved around. We're returning again to the idea that actually, the, you know, these are human beings, they're real individuals, they had real lives which have really been ruined, and we, we're once again sort of experiencing that. And it's a very important thing to remember. And, you know, as the state has grown larger, as we've increasingly, I mean, just a bugbear of mine is you, you, you know, these call centres that you have to call and you, everybody wants you to have an account and it's, it's all automated and you're not a real person, you know, you can't mm -hmm. get through. This is really shattering that dynamic. This is really going back to, which, of course, courts ought to do that. And one of the great scandals, I mean, I, I am, I'm, I'm not saying that the courts are innocent here either. I think, you know, real questions have to be asked about why these individuals couldn't effectively challenge it. As Paul, Paul raises, the, this evidential position where, where the, the, you know, the post office is effectively treated as true. 
And that, that's not fair. That, that's the, it's, it's a David and Goliath situation, and, and Goliath seems to be getting away with an awful lot. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm just raking in my mind. You know, when I was young, there, was a, there, was, there used to be a thing called the Wednesday play on the BBC, mm. which was extremely powerful. And there was one called Cathy Come Home, yeah. which I think was about uh, homelessness. And I think that was a kind of epoch-making drama. But I'm thinking now that people who make TV drama would be thinking to themselves, where do we go next? I mean, the obvious place to go next to me would be Grenfell Tower. Quite. I mean, there is another scandal where the, where the government is kind of saying, oh, well, there's not very much we can do. All these poor people who've got cladding and can't sell their houses and their lives. Well, I said on air in a, in a, in a different channel a couple of days ago that perhaps the, the infected blood scandal victims might, <laughs> might need a, uh, a TV drama. But I think the TV drama's effect was even greater because it... It comes at a time when perhaps public confidence in politics, politicians, institutions generally is at, a, at an all-time low. So I think that, had, that that almost turbocharged the public reaction, and politicians were reacting to what a, over a million. Well, I think it's now 1.4 million people demanding, well, you know, supporting Paula Venels being stripped of her CB, not not being allowed to actually uh, just hand it over, but being in some formal way humiliated by it being stripped of it. Mm -hmm. let, uh, let, let's go back to the courts. I mean, I, I feel deeply shocked by this. You know, the idea that, uh, as we see it in the drama, ping, some figures start appearing on a computer screen that tell you that you suddenly owe the post office £36,000. <clears> and you go off to court with, according to the drama, very little chance of getting justice and a real chance that you'll be saddled, in the case of one of them, with a £300-and-something-thousand-pound set of costs. I mean, how are we to maintain public faith in British justice? Well, over the last 20 years, so I'm 21 years call as a barrister, that's what we call it, and over my lifetime, we have seen people getting further and further away from justice. Ordinary people do not realistically have access to courts, and when they do, they face this monstrous situation. I mean, we, we talk about other scandals. I mean, Michael, I was prosecuted by Camden Council without my knowledge for non-payment of, of council tax for, for a flat I had rented years before, and, and they, they prosecuted me on a false basis. I didn't own it. But, but that all went through a totally automated mm. process. We, we're living through increasingly automated processes which are unjust, and I think this drama, thank goodness, has brought a lot of attention to that. I think we're going to see more of these scandals. I yes, think they're going to come out the, of the woodwork. This weekend, I learned something on this one that I hadn't realised before. Back in 1999, there was a meeting, a group meeting of sub-postmasters and mistresses in Newcastle who, who were taking part in the trials for the Horizon system. And they had this meeting to protest and complain about the fact the computer system wasn't working and was actually throwing up mm -hmm. anomalies. What happened? This is, so this goes back, in fact, to 1999 when the alarm bells were first being raised. Or, or, or possibly more, because there's also a story today about Tony Blair being urged not to cancel the Fujitsu contract. And I think that goes back to uh, when he first came to power in it, 1997. Indeed, it, allegedly. The, it, the, 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 fear, the, the, the country will put pressure on, you know, on the Japan. government not to be for the sake of British-Japanese relations. I mean, extraordinary. Well, there are. We've all been very indignant together, and I think <laughs> absolutely justifiably. Uh, by the way, I might just say that uh, James Arbuthnot MP, as he was then, comes out of the drama uh, pretty well. So the, the so role Kevin of the, Jones as well. The, the role of the MP is still important, but the MPs were not able to bring about right. what the TV drama has brought about, the realisation, apparently, that the government can legislate its way to justice. Thank you very much to Stephen Barrett and Paul Conyu. After the break, I'll be joined by one of the foremost historians of modern China, Professor Rana Mitter of Harvard University, to discuss the outcome of the elections in Taiwan. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. An increasing chance of seeing some snow over the next few days for some of us. We've already seen snow showers into areas of northern Scotland on Sunday and they will persist throughout this evening and overnight. Increasingly though, pushing into parts of Northern Ireland as well and that brings the risk of some icy stretches where those showers are falling on frozen surfaces. For all of us though, it is going to be a very cold night. Widely frosty across all areas of the UK, even towns and cities dropping as low as minus two, minus three degrees Celsius. So you certainly may need to scrape the car 
first thing on Monday morning. The chances of seeing snow on Monday is all about those areas that are exposed to the northerly breeze. So again, northern Scotland, northern Ireland, a few sleet showers for western Wales, southwest England, and perhaps some skirting eastern coast of Yorkshire down to Norfolk as well. Further inland, it is going to be dry, but with widespread sunshine across the board. Still feeling very cold though, temperatures around 1-2 degrees Celsius at best, but feeling sub-freezing if you are exposed to the very brisk easterly wind along those coasts there. On Tuesday, our attention turns to this feature that's going to start pushing its way into the northwest. As it moves into the cold air ahead of it, that does bring the risk of some further snowfall, particularly for central areas of Scotland down across the Pennines. For parts of Northern Ireland, it'll be a bit more of a transient rain snow feature and then eventually to other areas of Northern England as well. Southern areas staying drier, but the cold theme persists right throughout the coming week. Bye bye. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back. In Taiwan, voters have elected William Lai of the incumbent Democratic Progressive Party as the island's next president. He's referred to by Beijing as a troublemaker, and his party has been the more vocally resistant to Beijing's pretensions to rule Taiwan. 
While the election result might suggest a continuation of the status quo on the island, as Xi Jinping continues to insist that Taiwan must unify with China as a matter of course, and the United States election later this year could have an equally profound ramifications for the island. I'm delighted to be joined by the historian of modern China, Professor Rana Mitter of Harvard University. Welcome to GB News. Um, would you mind educating me in particular by telling me, first of all, what is the status of Taiwan? How does Taiwan regard itself as, I believe, as autonomous rather than independent? Michael, in a sense, Taiwan's position is almost unique globally in that it's a state but it's not a recognized state. So for instance, it doesn't have a seat at the United Nations and other countries don't have full diplomatic relations with it, including the UK, including the US. But it does have its own autonomous government. It's able to elect its own leader, as we've just seen in the election that took place 24 hours ago. And it does have trade and cultural and economic relations with much of the rest of the world, including mainland China. So essentially the term that's used for it, it's an unrecognized state. You might say slightly more fancifully, it's the the last unfinished business of the Cold War, from China's point of view, becomes the only province of China that wasn't taken over in 1949 when the communists won the revolution under Chairman Mao. On this point of the status of Taiwan and the relationship with the People's Republic, what were the choices that were offered to the Taiwanese people in this election? Essentially, it was a spectrum of grey, you might say. It wasn't black and white. Essentially, the winning party, the DPP, is more in favour of an autonomous status for Taiwan. Technically, there are people there who advocate full independence, but actually, those don't tend to be the leaders because they know that would be a sort of red line for Beijing who threatened all-out war if there's ever a formal declaration of independence. But they are open to talking to China. It's just that China refuses to talk to them because they regard them as troublemakers and separatists. On the other side, is the KMT, the Nationalist Party, which actually back in the 1930s and 40s was a dictatorship under Chiang Kai-shek, a name that some of your older listeners or viewers might, might remember. These days, it's a fully democratic, multi-party uh, organization. It's very different. But it does believe in a more open dialogue with China. And the Chinese have been said that they're willing to accept a dialogue with them. It's the end results that's the issue. The KMT is still in favor of a democratic Taiwan. And it's not clear that Xi Jinping's China would fully accept that. So how would you assess the significance of the choice made by the Taiwanese people? I'd say in some sense it's business as usual, actually. It's slightly less dramatic than might appear the, the case. Uh, the same party that's been in power for two terms is getting a third term, but also, perhaps less noticed, the Congress, uh, the Legislative UN, as it's known in Taiwan, has actually gone for a sort of hung parliament. The KMT actually won that just about, 52 seats there, 51 for the DPP, and eight for a third party, the Taiwan People's Party. And I think that what we might see is some attempt to try and use the Congress by the opposition, a bit like in the United States, when we have a split uh, administration there, to try and um, alter policy. That may mean that there's a more pragmatic question about how far, for instance, economic relations with China can continue. Don't forget that 80% of Taiwan's economy is in some way linked to the mainland, at the same time as sticking to the central point that Taiwan needs to be able to decide its own fate autonomously and won't essentially be forced by, be forced by China into some form of unification. How has the People's Republic reacted and how do you think it will react? The language may, may, may not make it look that way, Michael, but actually they reacted rather mildly compared to what they might have done. They certainly haven't sent out flights of fighter jets, which they have done in the past. They've said that he's a troublemaker, but in the wider scale of, uh, of, of insults, um, uh, that's probably, probably in the middle level. Um, and I think they're waiting to see what happens. Essentially, for 2024, I don't expect that there's going to be much of a really uh, radical reaction from the mainland because they're waiting to see who becomes president of the United States in November. If it's a continued Biden administration, they may decide that having to put pressure on Taiwan is necessary because Biden has said that he will defend Taiwan. If it's a ne second uh, um, uh, uh, administration for president Trump coming back, I think they actually don't know what to think. They think it could be anything from him really pushing hard on the China button, as he did in his first term, or they may think that, as with Putin, it's possible to do a deal with Donald Trump over Taiwan in a way that Biden simply wouldn't do. So I think they're waiting to hang fire and see what happens in November this year in the US. Do you think that there's any influence that the new president of Taiwan can have on Donald Trump or indeed on Joe Biden? Will there be lobbying in this period before the election result is known in the United States? 
Yes, they will. I think that with uh, both Trump and Biden, they can make a strategic case that, first of all, for one of the world's most important commodities, semiconductors, of which something like 50 percent of the world's supply of high quality semiconductors comes out of TSMC, one single company in Taiwan. That is a globally strategic product and Taiwan can play that card. Also, of course, the naval issue. If Taiwan ever did become unified with China, peacefully or otherwise, the Chinese Navy could operate off Taiwan's ports. And that would mean the West Western Pacific essentially would no longer really be under American dominance. The other issue, though, I think is more of a Biden one than a Trump one, which is democracy. Um, the Taiwanese are very keen to point out they are a multi-party free society with free media and free elections. President Biden probably cares. Well, he's no, we know he cares about that a great deal. President Trump was more ambivalent, you might say, about the value of democracy as a good in its own right in overseas territories. So the Taiwanese may adapt depending on who actually comes to power. And in Beijing, are there hawks and doves? Is there debate within the administration as to what to do? Yes, there is. We're fairly sure that there is, but we don't know the details of what it is because it's so opaque. I would say that right now the major debate is between those, probably a minority, who really think they should push hard on Taiwan, and right now actually probably a majority, who look at China's domestic economic situation. They look at high youth unemployment. They look at a property market, which is becoming very weak indeed. They see also a country which needs to develop its technological skills through interaction with the outside world. That side of things, I think, at the moment is more dominant. And for that reason, we're likely to see angry, but probably relatively muted responses from Beijing when it comes to geopolitics. The other brief issue I'd point out is that as the Middle East and, of course, Ukraine continue to burn on, the Chinese have a vested interest essentially in not creating a third um, theater in, uh, of, of war in the world. After all, they too may well suffer from the uh, firing by Houthis on Red Sea shipping because their fuel, their shipping, their food is also affected, even if it's not directly in the line of intentional fire. How very interesting. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Rana Mitter. In a few moments, I'll speak with an Irish journalist who's been vindicated in a legal action launched by a Sinn Féin politician and former IRA bomber Jerry Kelly. Before that, here are the latest news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. It's 12.30. I'm Aaron Armstrong. A very good afternoon to you. And the number of migrants who died trying to cross the English Channel overnight has risen to five. French officials say a small boat carrying dozens of people got into difficulties just off a beach north of the port of Boulogne. A huge rescue effort took place. French maritime vessels were involved with a helicopter and emergency services combed the area at Wimereux. A further two migrant boats arrived in the UK waters this morning and at least 100 people have been taken to Dover. The Foreign Secretary's warned the Houthis of further strikes in Yemen if attacks in the Red Sea continue. Lord Cameron says the UK has sent an unambiguous message but will continue to back words with action. Writing in The Telegraph, he says disruption in the Red Sea vi threatens vital supply chains which could force up prices in Britain. A record 420,000 patients had to wait more than 12 hours in A&E last year. The latest NHS England figures show one in 15 patients faced so-called trolley waits, which have been linked to excess deaths and increased harm. Lib Dem leader Sir Ed Davies accusing the Prime Minister of driving the health service into the ground. And an Arctic blast is hitting the UK, prompting weather warnings. Uh, northern Scotland could see up to 10 centimetres of snow today and it will be a similar scene in Northern Ireland tomorrow. The freezing temperatures are likely to move further south over the course of the week, affecting parts of Northern England. Uh, roads and railways are likely to be disrupted. We'll be back with more at the top of the next hour or you can get more right now on our website, gbnews.com. Thank you very much, Aaron Armstrong. In Northern Ireland, the journalist Malachi O'Doherty has spent three years battling a defamation action brought against him by the Sinn Féin politician and convicted former IRA bomber Jerry Kelly. O'Doherty said in a radio interview that Kelly had shot a prison officer during an escape in 1983, something which Kelly does not admit. 
However, a High Court judge in Belfast said Kelly's reputation was already tarnished for his conviction of the bombing of the Old Bailey in 1973 and that his own writings implied joint culpability for the shooting on the balance of probabilities. The judge called the defamation claim scandalous, vexatious and an abuse of process. Sinn Féin, which is the biggest party on both sides of the border in Ireland, is accused of trying to intimidate journalists with lawsuits, something which it denies. I'm pleased that Malachi O'Doherty joins me now. Uh, welcome to GB News. Do you want to tell me something about what you've been through over the last three years? <laughs> Well, Michael, uh, it's more than three years. It's four and a half years because that's how far, far back the original solicitor's letter was. Um, well, I mean, we don't like getting these letters. We don't like the threat of defamation hanging over us. None of, no, none of us do. And it's a threat that the journalists face occasionally. This one, see, was a particularly stressful one in some ways in that there were so many hurdles along the way. I mean, uh, what Kelly did was he issued the solicitor's letter and then we had a full year before lodging a writ in the High Court. Then we had another full year before serving that writ. And then another eight months before um, uh, issuing a statement of claim. And, and uh, you know, so, so what he has done is he has set these hurdles or these deadlines, and he's gone to the very end of each deadline uh, to draw the thing out as far as possible. So in that sense, I mean, approaching those deadlines, it was, it was certainly a very stressful business. Um, I suppose there was some comfort and some reassurance in what seemed fairly obvious that he was not going to go into court to be cross-examined on the shooting of a prison officer, and therefore that he was, if it came to the very end of it, and and we actually were going into court to hear a defamation case, he was uh, he was not likely to go through with it at that at that stage. That was my gambit anyway, or that was my gamble that he wouldn't do that, and therefore I held in there. Um, the defamation was alleged uh, following remarks that you made on two different radio channels, but That's right. the action was brought against you, not against the radio channels. Was that significant? Well, it is significant because uh, the radio channels were the logical ones to go for. They had the platform through which to issue a retraction or a clarification if one was required. They were the ones with the resources to, to settle a legal dispute by paying compensation to him uh, if, if he felt that money would assuage his damaged reputation. Um, so the logical thing was to go for them. Going for me suggested that those were not his priorities at all, you know, because I didn't have the money to, to pay him off. And, uh, and I didn't have the platform through which to make a retraction, apology or clarification. Um, so, uh, Sinn Féin obviously denies uh, that there's any uh, campaign here of trying to silence or intimidate journalists, but are you implying that you think there is? I don't know if there is. Uh, I mean, if the leaders of Sinn Féin say, and they are saying, and they're tending to say it routinely in the same form of words each time, uh, that there is no such campaign, then I can't present the evidence which says that there is. Um, but, uh, but certainly there are a number of these cases. We're talking about this, for instance, as if Jerry Kelly has only sued me for saying he shot John Adams. He's also suing another journalist with Dudley Edwards and at least one other person that I know of. Um, so, so he's putting some energy into this, having let the matter go for years with it being routinely said in books and documentaries about the prison escape that he led. And even if you can't make a case for there being a, a campaign, are there other instances not re not related to Jerry Kelly of actions being brought against journalists? Yes, there are many, and many of them are listed in the in the Sunday papers today in Ireland. Um, I don't have the list at hand. I don't, I don't want to to risk making a mistake and outlining them for you. But uh, but certainly there 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 are several, and there's a forthcoming Arctis committee hearing at the Dáil to discuss this because there is a feeling uh, that has yet to be clearly refuted that there is a, a campaign going that Sinn Féin is intent on uh, on silencing journalists who the judge in this case called bothersome. I'm officially bothersome. That's been handed down from the... That's a judicial ruling now. I'm a bothersome. I'm a um, bothersome journalist. Well, you've had the success exactly what you've just described. Um, what is the significance of your success? Does it have a broader um, meaning? Well, I think it does. I think in one sense it's... Uh, it certainly 
it's a it's a reassurance for me. Uh, the you know that that I was that I was right that I was right to hold out and and not to uh, settle because within defamation law most people settle and people settle when they have a good chance of winning but they settle because the risks of dragging it out of going ahead with it uh, are too expensive and so they don't do that the other thing that this particular case shows is that uh, there is a mechanism by which you can get a defamation case struck out before it goes to the full High Court hearing. Because what we did was we went to the Master's Court uh, with a claim that the in, that the writ be struck out as vexatious rather than wait to go to a full hearing for a defamation case. And that was precisely your success. Thank you very much, Maliki O'Doherty. After the break, as the British Museum hastens to find a new director, what should be its priorities? I'll be discussing that in a few minutes. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back. The process to find a new director of the British Museum is underway as the institution faces pressing questions. Should it return the Parthenon marbles? How is it to be funded? Can it be trusted since thousands of artefacts have been stolen in recent years? 
What is the future of the British Museum? To discuss that, I'm joined by archaeologist Dr Mario Trabuco de la Torreta and John Sharples, a lawyer at Howard Kennedy, who led a legal action on behalf of a poet whose work had been used by the British Museum without attribution. Uh, welcome to you both. Hello. Um, Mario, let's start with you. Can you give me some assessment of how the reputation of the British Museum nationally and internationally stands today, in your view? I think the British Museum is still uh, the glorious institution that we all know and recognize. Uh, yes, it is true that it has uh, been dealt a blow. Uh, we don't yet know all the facts about this blow and the fact that all of this is still shrouded mystery, probably hangs like a little bit of a cloud on uh, on the reputation. And we are in a phase of kind of rebuilding. So there is uh, hope and confidence in the future, the brilliant work that Mark, Mark Jones has been doing and uh, which will deliver to, the, to his successor. It's definitely a good promise for the future. So I don't think... Uh, uh, we are talking about a British Museum in tatters or something that needs to be disbanded or, or, or whatnot. It's still uh, uh, very solid, very um, uh, conspicuous in terms of uh, its position in the art scene. And the director of the British Museum, of course, uh, is still uh, a leading voice and will be a leading voice on the international heritage stage. Mario, are you thinking that it's really the theft business that has clouded the reputation of the museum? Or do you think it's also clouded by the way the Parthenon Marbles issue has been handled recently? The Parthenon Marbles issue has been uh, going around for uh, 200 plus years. So at the end of the day, uh, yes, there are uh, flares up, uh, flaring up of this uh, uh, kind of debate, but it's not uh, something uh, uh, new or something that basically threatens the reputation of the museum as such. The museum has a legal ownership of these uh, marbles and is doing what it can to defend this legal ownership, quite rightly so. Uh, on the other side, uh, um, I think, uh, yes, there has been a, a little bit of destabilization in a way with uh, all these uh, clock and dagger intrigues uh, uh, led by George Osborne in uh, uh, finding these uh, agreement, uh, uh, and not better specified agreement, uh, with the Greek government. Uh, and it's probably more uh, the uncertainty around this uh, and the lack of transparency around this uh, that is something that may kind of threaten not the reputation of the British Museum, but the confidence that, for example, investors and donors may have in, uh, in the institution, uh, which is obviously a very big chapter when it comes to rebuilding the museum in the uh, fabled Rosetta project, uh, a project of one, million, one billion pounds that needs to be found somewhere. John, the same very broad question to you. How do you believe the, the reputation of the British Museum stands presently? Yeah, well, in, in some ways, the new director has the most unenviable job imaginable because the British Museum couldn't possibly be held in any lower esteem at the moment. On the other hand, that's a great opportunity for that person because they start from that low base and it's a huge opportunity to, to do things in a different way. Why, uh, why? What are the factors that, in your view, have brought it to such a low esteem? Yeah, well, the argument, the, those high-handed colonialist arguments about the British Museum being the most suitable place to look after the world's heritage do fall away somewhat in the light of the recent uh, scandal over the theft. Also, the, ca the, the case I was involved in, um, you know, the British Museum's instinct, like so many institutions, is to stonewall conversation rather than open itself up to some vulnerability and consider that it might have done things in the wrong way. So, um, so the, the British Museum is at a very low ebb in, in how it's seen around the world at the moment. So that we understand from the position from which you're yeah. speaking, you, you are representing or helping to represent the Greek government in this issue? Uh, one of my colleagues at the firm I work at has been involved in repatriation cases over the last sort of 15 years or so. So it's, um, yeah, it's an area that we're active in. But I think one of your arguments is that the, the, the pose, the position that has been taken by the British Museum makes its relations with other institutions more difficult. Absolutely. So there are some very difficult cases in this area, and it would be silly to, present, to pretend otherwise. But one of the easiest cases of them all is the Parthenon sculptures debate. It's absolutely obvious that they should go back. And there are very few people who now 
take the contrary position, um, um, Mario being one of them, but you're increasingly a, a fringe figure. Most of us see that it's now not a question of if, it's a question of when, and to some extent a question of how. But um, and that's that, that's a, that's that's a huge change. In some ways, that's a, a very positive change because when my colleagues started working on this 15 years ago, it, you know, it's felt to be an um, intractable issue. Now nobody thinks that we will be not the first domino to fall, but the last domino to fall. Um, Macron has done it. The Germans have done it. Even the Pope has done it. So surely it's time for us to do it as well. Um, Mario, let's talk about bricks and mortar for a moment. Uh, did you you made a reference just there to needing a million pounds? Is that basically billion. a billion? Uh, oh, a bi <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misheard you. A that is an unbelievable figure. A billion pounds. What's that for? It's for refurbishing the entire museum, and uh, we are talking about a huge project that is going to last decades. And uh, uh, obviously, we are talking about a b building that was built uh, in the, the early 1800s. And uh, yes, obviously, it's been uh, refurbished, uh, piecemeal uh, here and there, uh, updating the infrastructure. But there are huge problems. For example, it's a building that is not made for the circulation of six million uh, yearly uh, visitors. For example, mm, if you go mm, to make just an example, in the Parthenon marbles, you enter from one narrow door and you exit from the same narrow door. No, it's Very unsatisfactory, museum, wouldn't you say, Mario, in terms of a, a mode that, of display? That, that, that uh, uh, particular uh, uh, hall of the British Museum has been created in 1962, open in 1962, d designed in, in, in yeah. 1938. So obviously, yes, it was uh, other times and uh, other necessities. If we were to design it now, as we are trying to do now, Obviously, it's going if to only be there were a modern state-of-the-art museum somewhere in the world that could host the Parthenon. And John is referring to the, the, fact that the Parthenon Museum in, in, in Athens is an absolute joy of a museum. I will absolutely I, say. I, I disagree. <laughs> but, but let's take the, 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 the matter of funding. Um, John, do you have strong feelings about where they can go for the money? I believe that part of their digitization program is being funded by PP, BP. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, I, I don't personally have a problem with that. I think it's quite literal-minded to object to BP as against other participants in our inherently destructive capitalist system. But, um, <laughs> but the British Museum clearly has a job to do to make itself an attractive brand for funders, you know, to be a partner that, that the kind of people who want to fund things want to be associated with. And it simply won't achieve that by doubling down and holding the line like people like Mario advocate for. It's the, the best the best opportunity to, to create an attractive brand is to show a, a new willingness to be open and uh, in conversation with the world, world rather than stonewalling it. Mario, it looks like we, we're looking for a rather exceptional candidate. Do you think such a candidate exists? And would you, would you think that such a candidate was likely to come from the United Kingdom or somewhere else? I think they are being uh, very open-minded in the way they are looking uh, for uh, the next talent uh, to occupy this very significant position. And uh, uh, in the, in the um, uh, application pack, you can see that they, they are saying uh, we are even looking outside the museum uh, area because at the, at the end of the day, we are talking about £1 billion renovation, renovation project, 1,000 workforce. It's, it's it's, uh, it's uh, a proper, uh, very big institution. We are looking uh, uh, for a person that probably has been managing a university, has been managing uh, a, a branch of a culture or department uh, anywhere in the world. So m it must be somebody that is uh, very well versed on uh, the administrative and economic part of the scheme, but also somebody that is uh, uh, academically proficient and somebody that is trustworthy in terms of uh, the, the, the confidence that we can give him uh, uh, supreme reign over the collection. It's an extraordinary specification. Oh, yes, what, 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 what do you think about the sort of candidate we're looking for? Yeah, I think it's probably a mistake to think that one person could possibly um, embody all the qualities of a hyper competent administrator and CEO and the kind of communicator who needs to to make the case for the new and renewed role of the British Museum in the world. Maybe you fancy the job, Michael. You have been on the journey of a what, difficult uh, brand yes, to yes. national treasure. Uh, 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 You're perfectly well-placed. I'm working under George Osborne, but let me just put that point to you. It's got a chairman, yeah. George Osborne, yes. who is an enormous public figure. Yes. So maybe he should be left to do the communications bit of it. What do you think? Well, uh, the fact that George Osborne fancies himself as a, as a public figure has been a key part of the recent shift, because his, um, his point of view is that there is a deal to be done in 
his words. And that's obviously a sea change with the attitudes in the past, where the idea of a, a deal was just completely rejected. So, um, so that his the standing the standing that he has and the experience he has on the on the international stage, you know, is probably a good thing for the British Museum at the moment. Jolly good discussion. Thank you very much. I, I, I thank John Sharples and Dr. Mario Trabuco della Torretta. I thank all my guests who've been on today. I give my special appreciation to those who journeyed into the studio today. Uh, I really value that enormously. Dawn Neeson will be taking over in a few minutes. I'll be back at the same time next week. And uh, until then, goodbye. And I look forward very much to seeing you next Sunday. Bye until then. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. An increasing chance of seeing some snow over the next few days for some of us. We've already seen snow showers into areas of northern Scotland on Sunday and they will persist throughout this evening and overnight. Increasingly though, pushing into parts of Northern Ireland as well and that brings the risk of some icy stretches where those showers are falling on frozen surfaces. For all of us though, it is going to be a very cold night. Widely frosty across all areas of the UK, even towns and cities dropping as low as minus two, minus three degrees Celsius so you certainly may need to scrape the car first thing on Monday morning. The chances of seeing snow on Monday is all about those areas that are exposed to the northerly breeze. So again, northern Scotland, northern Ireland, a few sleet showers for western Wales, southwest England, and perhaps some skirting eastern coast of Yorkshire down to Norfolk as well. Further inland, it is going to be dry, but with widespread sunshine across the board. Still feeling very cold though, temperatures around 1-2 degrees Celsius at best, but feeling sub-freezing if you are exposed to the very brisk easterly wind along those coasts there. On Tuesday, our attention turns to this feature that's going to start pushing its way into the northwest. As it moves into the cold air ahead of it, that does bring the risk of some further snowfall, particularly for central areas of Scotland down across the Pennines. For parts of Northern Ireland, it'll be a bit more of a transient rain snow feature and then eventually to other areas of Northern England as well. Southern areas staying drier, but the cold theme persists right throughout the coming week. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment.
Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello and welcome to GB News Sunday. Indeed, happy Sunday. Hoping you have a lovely afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us this lunchtime. I'm Dawn Neeson and for the next two hours, 